I'm Sula, and this is day two of Eight Day Astronomer. On day one, I introduced myself and I went over my credentials and I provided an outline for this course. And this is day two. One of the first things you'll need to do on your journey to becoming a visual astronomer is to learn how the sky works. If you go outside and you look at a star, after about an hour, it will appear as if that star has moved 15 degrees. About the distance between your index finger and your pinky finger on your outstretched arm. Why is that? Well, the easiest way to think about it is how the ancient astronomers did. Alexandrian astronomer Claudius Ptolemy wrote the Almagest in 150 BC in which he explained the motion of the stars by concluding that the earth was surrounded by spheres and one of the spheres contain the stars, and another sphere contain the planets and the moon. And in his view, it was these spheres moving around the earth that explain the motion of the stars. Today we know that this is not true. The stars are not moving. Well, stars do move a little bit, and it's called proper motion, but it can't be detected by the naked eye. But the stars are not moving around the earth. The stars don't move around the Earth. We're moving. The Earth spins on its own axis about once every 24 hours or so, and the Earth is also orbiting the Sun about once every 365 days or so, and the planets are also orbiting the Sun at different speeds, and the Moon is orbiting the Earth every 27.3 days, and our own galaxy is spinning, and we're hurtling through space but it appears to us as if the stars are moving around us, as if they're on a sphere revolving around the Earth. But the stars are not moving. We're moving. But to understand what's happening in the parade of stars every night, let's pretend that the stars are revolving around the Earth on a sphere, and the sphere is tilted depending on where you live on Earth. If I run a pole, through the center of the Earth, from the South Pole through the North Pole and extended into space, it points to the North Celestial Pole. And if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, all the stars in the heavens revolve around the North Celestial Pole, or they appear to. There's one star that's close to, but not exactly, the North Celestial Pole, and that star is Polaris, or the North Star. If you don't know which way is north, you can go outside and use a compass. A real compass will point to magnetic north, which is not the same as true north because the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field. But if you use the compass on your phone, you can set it to use true north. And then if you go out at night and you point your phone's compass to true north, it will point to Polaris. How high Polaris will be in the sky depends on where your latitude is on Earth. I'm at 45 degrees latitude, so Polaris will always be 45 degrees above the horizon, or about halfway from the horizon to completely overhead, which is called the zenith. If you look at Polaris at night, and then you go back two hours later and you look again, it will be in pretty much the same spot you saw it originally and it'll remain there all night and every night. But all the other stars in that same direction will appear to rotate around Polaris, rising in the east and rotating counterclockwise. Do you know how to recognize the Big Dipper? It's that bowl with a curved handle at the end of it. You find it by facing north, and you can see it year round, except it can be hard to see in early winter because it's low on the horizon. But if you look at the Big Dipper in spring, it will look like the bowl is on top of the handle, pointing straight down. And in summer, it'll be pouring out its contents. And in autumn, it'll be upright. And then in winter, it will be mostly hidden, unless you're somewhere with a clear view to north. But if you just go out at night and you look at the Big Dipper, notice its position, and then come back two hours later, and it'll have rotated around Polaris well actually around the North Celestial Pole. And in fact, the last two stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper are called the pointer stars because they always point to Polaris. Just over the edge of the observatory roof 
is the little dipper co-cab right at the roof and above it polaris and then the two stars over the tree are the two pointer stars of the big dipper just rising because my view to the north in winter is blocked by those tall trees but if i stood out here for a couple of hours i could watch the big dipper rise until it was fully visible now it's 11:15, and all four stars of the bowl of the big dipper are now visible above the trees and polaris is in the same position pretty much above the roof of the observatory now if i can tolerate this unbelievable cold <laughs> i'll look at it again in 30 minutes and we'll start to see the handle now it's 12 30 and you can see the handle of the big dipper and the bowl and polaris is still over the roof now i have to go in because it's so cold out here even Polaris rotates around the North Celestial Pole because it's so close, I think three quarters of a degree, you won't notice it moving. If it's winter time, you can look east in early winter or south in midwinter to look for something familiar, and that would be the three belt stars of the constellation Orion the Hunter. Orion is a very bright constellation that can be seen even in light polluted areas and cities. It has so many bright stars that it dominates the winter sky. Once you locate Orion's belt, you should be able to make out the reddish star above the belt, and that's Betelgeuse. And then there's a bright white star diagonally below the belt, and that's Rigel. Now you can identify your first constellation if it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Look at Orion and note his position and then go back outside two hours later, and you'll notice that Orion has moved quite a bit from where you first saw it. Okay, it's 10 o'clock, and there's the house, that bright star, Sirius, and above it, we can see Orion's belt, and Betelgeuse and Rigel. Now, we're gonna come back in 15 minutes and see how far Orion has moved. Okay, now it's 10.30 and Orion was in the center of the screen but it's moved over this much in 30 minutes. But now you know that Orion did not actually move but the Earth moved in its daily rotation on its own axis, and we'll pretend that we're the center of the universe and say that Orion moved across the sky from east to west, and indeed all the stars in that direction have now moved from east to west. And if you stay outside late enough, you can even see the constellation set in the west. And that's because the Earth is rotating on its own axis about every 24 hours. But why can't you see Orion all year long? Well, not only are we rotating on our axis, but the Earth is orbiting the Sun about every 365 days or so. So the constellations that we see any given night depend on the season, except for the ones that rotate very closely around Polaris. Now you know a couple of constellations, Orion, and the other one is Ursa Major. That's the actual name for the constellation that the Big Dipper is a part of. Now you know why the stars appear to move every night and why you can only see some of the constellations in any given season. It's the motion of the Earth on its own axis and the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. But what about the Moon? Where is it? Well, the Moon is orbiting the Earth, and as the Earth rotates on its own axis from west to east, the moon also appears to rise in the east and set in the west. But we can only ever see one side of the moon, and that's because the moon also spins on its own axis and 
It spins at that speed at the exact same speed that it orbits the Earth. And this is called tidal locking. Also, the moon has no intrinsic brightness. It's just a bunch of rocks, and rocks don't shine. The moon shines only when it's illuminated by the sun. When the moon is directly opposite the sun in our sky, the side of the moon that we can see will be fully illuminated, and that's when the moon is full. And also, when the moon will rise just as the sun sets, and it'll set just before sunrise. The moon goes through phases, from new moon, which is when you can't see the moon at all because it's in between the earth and the sun and not illuminated by the sun at all. It goes from crescent phase, when we only see a thin crescent, to first quarter, when half of the side that we can see faces the earth is illuminated by the sun, to full moon, and then last quarter, last crescent, and back to new moon every 29.5 days. The reason it takes 29.5 days to go from new moon to new moon is because it takes the sun a couple of days to catch up to illuminate the moon again. When the moon is getting bigger, it's called waxing moon. And when it's getting smaller, it's called a waning moon. There's a lot more to know about our closest celestial neighbor, but I'll leave that for some other episode. But if you want to know where the moon will be on any given night and its phases, you can look up that information on a lunar calendar or at a website, dateandtime.com or Sky and Telescope, or you can get an app on your phone that will tell you. And I use one called the moon. But now, at least you know what causes the phases of the moon and the names of the phases. For your homework, go outside and face north and locate the Big Dipper and Polaris, or if it's winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, you can locate Orion's belt and the reddish star above it, Betelgeuse. And now I'll just leave you with a famous quote from Ptolemy. Well do I know that I am mortal, a creature of one day, but if my mind follows the wandering path of the stars, then my feet no longer rest on earth, but standing by Zeus himself, I take my fill of ambrosia, the food of the gods. I'll see y'all in the next episode, Dark Skies Forever, Sula, signing off.